In 2014, a young woman named Claire had just moved to a new city for work. She didn't know anyone, and her new apartment, a one-bedroom on the outskirts of town, felt far too empty. Claire worked long hours and spent her evenings scrolling through social media or browsing Craigslist to kill time. One night, while scrolling, she stumbled upon an ad for a kitten. Free to a good home, the ad read. The picture was adorable, a fluffy gray kitten with bright blue eyes. Claire had always loved animals, but never had time for one. With her new job and stable life, she decided this was a sign. She messaged the seller immediately. Within an hour, she received a response. The seller introduced themselves as Sarah and explained that they had found the kitten abandoned in an alley. They were fostering it, but couldn't keep it because of their own pets. Claire was sold and arranged to meet Sarah the next day. The meeting spot was a bit strange. A house on the edge of town, past the industrial district where warehouses and factories lined the street. Sarah told Claire to come at night because she worked late, and Claire, eager for her new pet, agreed. The next evening, Claire drove out to the address. As she neared the location, the area became more desolate. Streetlights flickered and the roads were lined with rundown buildings. She double-checked the address in her phone. It was correct. The house she pulled up to was small, with peeling paint and an overgrown yard. No lights were on. Claire felt uneasy but knocked on the door. There was no answer. She knocked again, louder this time. After a few moments, the door creaked open, revealing a woman in her mid-forties, wearing an old faded sweater. Her hair was greasy, and her eyes were glassy. Claire, the woman asked in a raspy voice, come in, the kitten's inside. Something about the woman's demeanor made Claire's skin crawl, but she brushed it off. She stepped inside and immediately noticed how cold it was. The house had a damp, musty smell, and it was eerily quiet. Sarah led her through a narrow hallway cluttered with old newspapers and broken furniture. They entered a dimly lit room in the back of the house. There he is, Sarah said, pointing to the corner. Claire squinted. There, huddled in a cage, was the kitten from the picture, but something was wrong. The kitten didn't move. It just sat there, staring blankly. Claire stepped closer, but before she could reach the cage, Sarah grabbed her arm, her grip ice cold and firm. Do you live alone? Sarah asked abruptly. Claire pulled her arm away, alarm bells ringing in her head. What? Why? Sarah's eyes narrowed. You didn't answer my question. Do you live alone? Claire's heart raced. I, I should go, she stammered, backing toward the door. Wait. Sarah's voice was desperate now. You can't leave yet. I need to show you something. Every instinct in Claire's body told her to run, but her feet felt rooted to the spot as Sarah moved toward a closet in the corner of the room. She flung the door open, and the sight inside made Claire's blood run cold. It was a collection of Polaroid pictures, hundreds of them pinned to the walls of the closet. In each one, a person stared blankly at the camera, standing in various rooms of the house, rooms Claire recognized from her short time there. The worst part was that none of the people in the photos looked alive. Their faces were slack, eyes vacant, like dolls propped up for a picture. Claire stumbled backward, her breath quickening. She bolted for the front door, but Sarah was faster. She blocked the exit, a twisted smile creeping across her face. You came here because you were lonely, right? Don't worry, I'll take care of that. Claire pushed past her with all her strength, flinging the door open and racing to her car. She didn't stop to look back as she sped down the dark streets, heart pounding in her chest. When she finally got home, she locked every door and window, shaking with adrenaline. The police arrived at Sarah's house the next day. They found it empty. No kitten, no Polaroids, no furniture, nothing. It was as if the house had been abandoned for years. Claire tried to explain what she had seen, but no one believed her. For weeks, Claire barely slept. Every time she closed her eyes, she saw Sarah's face, heard her voice asking that haunting question, do you live alone? And every night, Claire would hear strange noises, scratching at her door, soft whispers just outside her window. She convinced herself it was her imagination, a result of the trauma from that night. One evening, as Claire was getting ready for bed, her phone buzzed. It was a message from an unknown number. She hesitated before opening it, her heart racing. The message was just one line. I know you live alone now. Attached was a photo of Claire taken through her bedroom window.
in 2012, a man named James was searching for some secondhand furniture on Craigslist. He had just moved into a new apartment in a small town after getting a job at a nearby factory. His budget was tight, so he scoured the free section of Craigslist in hopes of finding something to furnish his bare rooms. One evening, he came across an ad for a vintage wooden dresser, described as being in excellent condition. The photos showed a beautiful antique piece, and the price? Free. The ad stated it had to be picked up immediately as the owner was moving out the next day. This seemed too good to pass up. James contacted the seller, who responded quickly. The seller's name was George, and he said he was glad someone was interested because he couldn't take the dresser with him. He gave James an address on the outskirts of town and told him to come after dark, as that was the only time he would be home from packing. James found this a little odd, but he figured it was just one of those quirks people had. He set out around 9 p.m., driving down winding country roads past fields and trees that loomed darkly against the night sky. The address led him to a large, old farmhouse surrounded by dense woods. The house was barely visible from the road, shrouded in shadows. He pulled up the long, gravel driveway and noticed that none of the lights in the house were on. He double-checked the address. It was right. Hesitating for a moment, he texted George to let him know he had arrived. Moments later, a light flickered on in the upstairs window. James felt a wave of relief and got out of his car. He knocked on the door, and after a few seconds, it creaked open. Standing in the doorway was a man in his fifties, disheveled and gaunt, with wild eyes that seemed a little too intense. His clothes looked rumpled, and his face was pale under the dim porch light. You must be James, the man rasped, his voice gravelly and low. Come on in. The dresser's in the basement. James hesitated. Something about the man's appearance and the eeriness of the house made him uneasy, but he forced a smile and stepped inside. The air was stale, thick with dust and the scent of old wood. The floorboards creaked underfoot, and the entire house felt damp, as if it had been abandoned for years. George led him through a narrow hallway, past rooms that looked completely empty, save for the occasional piece of furniture draped in old sheets. There were no signs of packing, no boxes, nothing that suggested someone was in the process of moving out. James tried to shake off the feeling of dread that was creeping over him as George motioned him toward a door at the end of the hallway. It opened to a set of steep wooden stairs leading down into a pitch black basement. The dresser's just down there, George said, his voice echoing unnaturally in the empty house. James peered down the stairs, feeling his stomach twist. He couldn't see anything in the darkness below. Could you turn on the light? James asked, trying to keep his voice steady. Oh, sorry, George muttered. Forgot about that. He fumbled with a switch on the wall and a single bare bulb flickered to life at the bottom of the stairs, casting long, eerie shadows. Something deep inside James screamed at him not to go down those stairs, but he didn't want to seem paranoid. Taking a deep breath, he slowly descended the creaky steps, his eyes scanning the basement for the dresser. As he reached the bottom, he saw the dresser in the far corner, covered by a dusty sheet. It was larger than he expected, almost too big to fit in his car, but it was exactly what he was looking for. As he walked over to it, he noticed something strange about the floor. Patches of it looked freshly disturbed, as if someone had been digging. A chill crawled up James's spine, and he froze in place. That's when he heard it. A faint sound, almost like whispering, coming from behind him. He spun around, his heart hammering in his chest, but the basement was empty. The whispering grew louder, more insistent, as if voices were surrounding him. He could make out fragments of words like, but they were too faint to understand. It sounded like multiple people, their voices overlapping in a frantic, hurried way. James backed toward the stairs, his breath coming in short, sharp gasps. That's when he noticed something even more terrifying. Against the far wall, where the light didn't quite reach, there was a door. A small metal door bolted shut, with deep scratch marks all around it, as if someone had been trying to claw their way out. The whispering grew louder, almost a desperate cry now. His hands shook as he stumbled up the stairs, but before he could reach the top, the basement door slammed shut with a deafening bang. James pounded on it, screaming for George to let him out, but there was no response. Then, as suddenly as it had slammed, the door creaked open again, 
revealing George standing there, smiling, his eyes darker than before. You really shouldn't have come down here alone, George said softly. James pushed past him, racing for the front door. He flung it open and bolted to his car, not daring to look back. As he sped down the driveway, heart pounding in his chest, he glanced in the rearview mirror. There, standing in the upstairs window, was George, watching him, still smiling. James never spoke of the incident to anyone, but a few days later, out of morbid curiosity, he searched for more information about the farmhouse. What he found chilled him to his core. Uh, the house had been abandoned for over a decade. The previous owner, uh, maimed George, had been arrested after multiple bodies were discovered buried in the basement. The victims had all been lured there through Craigslist ads, never to be seen again. In 2016, a woman named Hannah was desperately searching for a new apartment. Her lease was about to end and her budget was tight, so she scoured Craigslist daily, hoping to find something affordable. After weeks of searching, she found a listing that seemed perfect, a spacious one-bedroom apartment in a quiet neighborhood for an unbelievably low rent. The ad was posted by someone named Mr. Davis. There were no photos of the inside of the apartment, which seemed odd, but the description sounded great and she was running out of time. The ad mentioned that he preferred not to use email and requested phone calls only. Anxious, Hannah dialed the number listed. An older man with a gravelly voice answered. Mr. Davis explained that he was the landlord and owned a few properties in the city. He said the apartment was vacant and he could show it to her that evening. He asked if she lived alone. The question felt a little invasive, but Hannah, eager to move forward, told him yes. He then gave her the address, a building in an old part of town. That evening, Hannah drove to the location. The building was run down, the paint peeling, and the windows dark. The street was eerily quiet, no one in sight. Her unease grew as she stepped out of the car. Mr. Davis was waiting for her by the front door, just as he had said he would. He was an older man, his face deeply lined, his eyes sunken. He greeted her with a stiff, unsettling smile. Something about the way he looked at her made Hannah's stomach churn, but she told herself she was being paranoid. Come on in, Mr. Davis said, opening the door to the building. I'll show you the place. Hannah hesitated. The hallway inside was dimly lit, the air thick with the smell of mildew. But she didn't want to appear rude or back out now, so she followed him. They climbed a narrow staircase to the second floor where Mr. Davis unlocked a door at the end of the hall. He opened it slowly, the hinges creaking. The apartment was dark, and the air inside felt damp and stale. Mr. Davis fumbled with a light switch, but only a faint glow from a single overhead bulb lit the room. Hannah stepped inside, her eyes scanning the space. It was empty. There wasn't a stick of furniture, not even a stove or refrigerator. It felt cold, like no one had lived there in years. She glanced at Mr. Davis, who stood watching her intently from the doorway. Are there utilities included? She asked, trying to break the uneasy silence. All included, he said, his voice low, almost a whisper. Hannah felt a shiver run down her spine. Something was very wrong. She turned to leave, but Mr. Davis was still standing in the doorway, blocking her path. His smile had disappeared, replaced by a blank, almost predatory expression. You don't need to leave so soon, he said, his voice unnervingly calm. Why don't you take a better look around? Maybe check out the bedroom. Hannah's heart raced. She tried to stay calm, but her instincts screamed for her to get out. She forced a nervous laugh. Actually, I'm in a bit of a hurry. Maybe I'll come back tomorrow? Mr. Davis didn't move. Are you sure? The bedroom's just down the hall. It's perfect for someone like you, living alone. His words sent a bolt of fear through her. She edged toward the door, but he didn't budge. The small apartment felt like a trap, and the air grew heavy with dread. Suddenly, from the back of the apartment, she heard a noise, a low, muffled sound, almost like crying. Her blood turned to ice. She glanced toward the hallway that led to the bedroom, the shadows deeper there, and saw the faintest movement, as if something, someone, was hiding in the dark. Her mind raced, panic clawing at her chest. She had to leave. Now. I really have to go, she said, trying to keep her voice steady, inching closer to the door. Mr. Davis's eyes darkened. You shouldn't leave yet. Hannah's heart pounded in her ears. Without thinking, she darted past him, shoving him aside with more strength than she knew she had. 
She bolted down the hallway, her footsteps echoing off the cracked walls as she sprinted for the front door. Behind her, she heard him yelling, his voice no longer calm but furious and unhinged. Come back! You can't leave! But she didn't stop. She burst through the front door, running to her car, fumbling with her keys in the dim light. She jumped in and locked the doors, her hands shaking uncontrollably. In the rearview mirror, she saw Mr. Davis standing in the doorway of the building, his face twisted with rage. She sped off into the night, her pulse pounding, not daring to look back again. Shaken, she went straight to the police station. She told them everything, how the man had trapped her in the apartment, how she had heard crying from the bedroom. They took her statement, though they seemed skeptical. Still, they agreed to send someone to the building to investigate. A few days later, she received a call from the police. The officer on the phone sounded grim. Miss Baker, we looked into the property you mentioned, the apartment you described. It's been vacant for over five years. The landlord, a Mr. Davis, died a long time ago. He had been evicted after multiple tenants disappeared under mysterious circumstances. His body was found in the basement. Hannah felt her blood run cold. We found no sign of anyone living there now, the officer continued. But in the bedroom closet, we found something disturbing. A hole had been dug into the wall, leading to a hidden crawl space. Inside, we found evidence suggesting that people had been kept there against their will. The officer paused. You were lucky to get out of there when you did. In 2017, Ethan, a young college student, was looking for extra cash. He stumbled upon a Craigslist ad offering quick, easy money for an overnight job. Need someone to house sit for one night. Pay $500. No questions asked. The ad seemed too good to be true, but curiosity got the better of him. He called the number, and a man who identified himself as Mr. Gray answered. His voice was calm, almost too calm, and he explained that he needed someone to watch over his house while he was away. There wasn't much to it. Just stay inside, make sure everything was in order, and leave in the morning. It sounded easy enough, and... $500 was a lot of money for one night. Ethan accepted immediately. Mr. Gray gave him the address, which was on the outskirts of the city, in an isolated area surrounded by woods. That should have been a red flag, but Ethan, excited about the money, might ignored the feeling gnawing at him. He drove out that evening, as instructed, with nothing but his backpack and a few snacks to get him through the night. When he arrived at the house, it was almost dark. The house itself was large, old, and sat back from the road, barely visible through the dense trees. The windows were dark, and the front porch creaked as Ethan approached. He hesitated before knocking, wondering why anyone would need a house sitter way out here, but then shrugged it off. Money was money. Mr. Gray opened the door, and something about him unsettled Ethan immediately. He was tall and thin, dressed in an outdated suit, his face gaunt with deep-set eyes. He didn't smile. His eyes seemed to linger on Ethan for just a little too long before he spoke. Thank you for coming on such short notice, Mr. Gray said, his voice flat. I'll be leaving shortly. The rules are simple. Don't leave the house. Don't answer the phone. And whatever you do, don't go into the basement. Is that clear? Ethan laughed nervously, assuming it was some kind of joke, but Mr. Gray's expression remained dead serious. I'm not kidding, he added, his voice lower now. The basement is off limits. Ethan nodded, feeling more uneasy than he let on. Mr. Gray handed him the keys and left without another word. The door clicked shut behind him and suddenly the house felt much colder. Ethan walked through the house, see, turning on lights and checking out the rooms. The place was old fashioned but clean with minimal furniture and no decorations. It was eerily quiet, the kind of quiet that made the hair on the back of your neck stand up. He found himself constantly glancing over his shoulder as though someone or something might be watching him. Trying to shake the unease, Ethan settled in the living room with his laptop. Hours passed without incident, though the silence seemed to press in on him more and more. Around midnight, just as he was starting to doze off, he heard it, a faint noise coming from beneath the floor. It was so subtle at first that he thought he imagined it, but then he heard it again, faint, rhythmic thumping like something was knocking from below. The basement. Ethan's heart started to race. Mr. Gray had specifically told him not to go down there, and the warning echoed in his mind. But the sound continued, growing louder, more insistent. 
It was unmistakable now. Something was moving down there. Ethan stood, heart pounding in his chest. His curiosity gnawed at him, and against his better judgment, he found himself walking toward the door that led to the basement. It was in the kitchen, tucked away at the far end of the room. The closer he got, the louder the knocking became. When he reached the door, he paused, his hand hovering over the knob. Every instinct told him to stop, to leave, but something drew him closer, an almost magnetic pull that he couldn't resist. He turned the knob and opened the door. A set of rickety wooden stairs descended into the darkness below. The air was thick and cold, and the smell of damp earth wafted up to meet him. The knocking had stopped, but the silence felt even worse now. Ethan stood at the top of the stairs, frozen. For a moment, he considered slamming the door shut and walking away, but something in the darkness called to him. He took the first step, then another, the wooden stairs creaking under his weight. As he reached the bottom, the dim light from the kitchen barely illuminated the basement, casting long shadows that seemed to move on their own. His breath hitched as he scanned the room, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. It was just an old basement filled with dusty boxes and broken furniture. That's when he saw it. In the far corner, half hidden in the shadows, was a small door. It was too low for anyone to walk through, more like a crawl space, and it was slightly ajar. The strange pull became stronger, almost unbearable, as though something was waiting for him on the other side. Ethan's hand trembled as he reached for the door. The air around him grew colder, and he felt as though something was standing behind him, watching. But he couldn't stop himself. He pulled the door open. Inside, there was nothing but darkness. A small, dirt-floored space stretched out before him, barely large enough for someone to crawl into. And then, from the depths of the darkness, he heard it. Soft breathing, slow and deliberate, coming from the crawl space. Ethan's blood turned to ice. Before he could react, something lunged at him from the shadows. Cold, bony hands wrapped around his ankles, yanking him off balance. He screamed, scrambling to break free, but the grip tightened, pulling him toward the darkness. Panicking, Ethan kicked wildly, managing to wrench himself free. He bolted up the stairs, heart racing, slamming the basement door behind him. His chest heaved, and, and for a moment he thought he might pass out. But the house was silent again, as if nothing had happened. Ethan grabbed his things, ready to leave. Just as he reached the front door, his phone buzzed. It was a message from Mr. Gray. Did you go into the basement? Ethan's heart stopped. How did he know? Before he could respond, another message came through. Check the windows. Confused, Ethan glanced at the nearest window. His blood froze. Outside, standing in the shadows just beyond the trees, was a figure, tall and thin, watching him. It wasn't Mr. Gray. The figure stepped closer, and in the dim light, Ethan could see its face, hollow eyes, pale skin, and a twisted smile. He didn't wait to see more. Ethan bolted out the front door, into his car, and sped away, not daring to look back. The next morning, he tried to contact Mr. Gray, but the number was disconnected, and the Craigslist ad had disappeared. Curious, Ethan did some research on the house and found an old news article from years ago. The previous owner had gone missing after claiming something in the basement had come to life. No one had lived in the house since. In 2018, a man named Kyle, a 25-year-old graphic designer, was searching for a car. His old sedan had finally given up after years of neglect, and he needed something cheap and fast. He scoured Craigslist for days, hoping to find a deal that wouldn't break his budget. One evening, he came across a listing that immediately grabbed his attention. 2004 Honda Civic. Excellent condition. $1,200 OBO. Needs to go ASAP. The price was unbelievably low, and the pictures showed a spotless car. It looked too good to be true, but Kyle was desperate. He reached out to the seller, a man named Mason, who responded almost instantly. Mason said he had just moved to the area and didn't need the car anymore. He was willing to part with it cheaply because he needed to clear out his garage. Uh, Kyle asked to meet the same night to check it out, and Mason agreed, providing an address in a quiet suburban area about 40 minutes outside the city. Excited about the prospect of getting a steal, Kyle jumped into his friend's car and headed out. As they drove, the suburban streets became increasingly empty, the houses spread farther apart, and soon the road turned into a narrow, wooded lane. The GPS led them to a small, isolated house sitting at the end of a dirt driveway. 
The house was old, with peeling paint and a yard overgrown with weeds. A garage sat off to the side, its door slightly ajar. Kyle's friend James gave him a skeptical look. Dude, this feels sketchy. You sure about this? Kyle laughed nervously. It's just an old house. We'll check the car and get out of here. They parked the car, and as soon as Kyle stepped out, he felt a strange sense of unease. The air was thick and heavy, the woods surrounding the house eerily quiet. No crickets, no wind, nothing. Just silence. They approached the garage where the Honda Civic was parked, just like in the pictures. It looked perfect, almost out of place in the rundown setting. As they were inspecting the car, a voice called out from behind them. Hey there. Kyle and James spun around to see a man standing in the doorway of the house. Mason was tall and thin, wearing an old flannel shirt and dirty jeans. His face was gaunt, his smile too wide, his eyes hollow and dark. There was something off about the way he looked at them, like he was sizing them up, calculating something. You guys here for the car? Mason asked, his voice low and gravelly. Yeah, Kyle replied, forcing a smile. It looks good. Why are you selling it so cheap? Mason shrugged, stepping closer, his eyes never leaving Kyle's. Just need to get rid of it. Got too much stuff in the garage, you're getting a good deal. There was a long pause, the kind that made Kyle's skin crawl. Mason's gaze felt wrong, lingering just a second too long. James shifted uncomfortably beside him. Kyle cleared his throat. Mind if we take it for a test drive? Mason's smile faded slightly, and for a moment his face became completely expressionless. Then he nodded slowly. Sure, but you should take care when you're out there. Roads around here can be tricky at night. Kyle tried to brush off the unsettling feeling that was creeping over him and got into the driver's seat of the car. James sat beside him as they pulled out of the driveway and onto the narrow, winding road. Everything seemed fine at first. The car ran smoothly, and Kyle was already imagining the money he was saving. But as they drove further, the unease grew stronger. The road seemed darker than before, the trees pressing in from both sides, casting long, twisted shadows that danced in their headlights, Kyle could feel the weight of something, something invisible but oppressive, settling over them. After about ten minutes, Kyle noticed something strange. No matter how far they drove, they didn't seem to be making any progress. The road seemed to loop back on itself, taking them past the same landmarks over and over. First, a rusted-out mailbox. Then, a broken-down shed. Again and again, they passed the same spots. Didn't we just pass that? James asked, his voice tense. Kyle's hands tightened on the steering wheel. Yeah, we did. He turned the car around, trying to retrace their route back to Mason's house. But the same thing happened. They kept driving past the same landmarks, like they were stuck in some kind of twisted loop. Panic started to bubble up in Kyle's chest. He checked his phone for the GPS, but there was no signal. It was as if the road was alive, keeping them trapped. Then, the lights flickered. The car's headlights dimmed for a second, then came back on. But in that brief moment, Kyle saw something in the road ahead of them, something pale and human-like, but horribly twisted, standing in the middle of the road. Its face was contorted in a grotesque grin, its eyes black, and its limbs impossibly long. Kyle slammed on the brakes, but by the time the car screeched to a halt, the figure had vanished. James stared at him, wide-eyed. What the hell was that? I don't know, Kyle whispered, his voice shaking. I don't know. He tried to start the car again, but the engine sputtered and died. The lights flickered once more, casting long, distorted shadows all around them. The road, the trees, it all felt wrong, like the landscape itself was shifting, warping. Out of the corner of his eye, Kyle saw something move. Just a quick flash, but enough to send a jolt of fear through him. Then, they heard it. A scraping sound, like metal dragging against asphalt, coming from behind them. Slowly, both Kyle and James turned to look. Standing in the distance, barely visible through the darkness, was the figure again. This time, it was closer. Much closer. Its head tilted unnaturally to the side, and it started moving toward them, dragging something long and sharp behind it. The scraping grew louder, more grating, as it approached. Without thinking, Kyle grabbed the keys, trying again to start the car. The engine roared to life, and he slammed the car into reverse, tires screeching as they sped backward down the road. The figure disappeared into the darkness, but the scraping noise echoed in their ears long after it was gone. Somehow, they made it back to Mason's driveway, the house now looming in the distance. They jumped out of the car, 
hearts racing, and ran toward their friend's vehicle. Before they could leave, Kyle glanced back at the house, and there, standing in the open doorway, was Mason. His expression hadn't changed, but his eyes, they were darker now, almost hollow. Leaving so soon, Mason called out, his voice carrying through the night like a threat. Kyle didn't respond. He and James sped away, their tires kicking up dirt as they tore down the road. The next day, Kyle checked Craigslist to see if the listing was still up, but it wasn't. In fact, there was no trace of Mason, the car, or the house. It was as if the entire thing had never existed. A few months later, Kyle learned that the house had been abandoned for years. Rumor had it, the last owner had disappeared under mysterious circumstances, leaving behind only strange, twisted marks on the walls of the basement. 